welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Reed, and this is a series of conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. Take a little time and stretch out, because these talks are unhurried and meant to bring you to a top percentile understanding of something important. So, whether you're into startups or ideas, a techie or a lit major, take your time, engage your mind, and you'll be glad you did it. Especially this week, when we'll be talking to Chris Anderson, who is the de facto CEO of the TED organization, although he does not take that title. Chris is one of my favorite people in the world, in part because he says things like this. The future of the world is terrifying if you think of it as 12 billion mouths to feed coming soon your way. The world is going to struggle with that. If you think of it as 12 billion minds, each of which could make some kind of contribution to the future, the future potentially gets thrilling. One way or another, it's definitely the biggest experiment that humanity has ever undertaken. We'll get to the words that surround that quote in a bit, but for now, some quick context. You've probably seen a TED Talk or two, or maybe 500 in your time online. TED Talks are brainy. They often run 15 minutes or more, and they call for undivided attention. In this, they're the opposite of that lizard brain realm of clickbait, fake news, and ADD that so much of the internet has become. You may be aware that many TED Talks are taped at an annual event that draws the likes of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, the Google founders Elon Musk, and Al Gore, who gave the forerunner of his Inconvenient Truth speech at a TED conference. Attendees revel in five straight days of brain candy and one another's presence. And by design, the huge conference fees that they pay fund the free distribution of the ideas that spring from the TED stage to everyone else in the world who wants to access them. TED states that it's all about ideas worth spreading. And this is what all of its considerable resources have gone into since Chris bought the organization in 2001 with money he had put into a foundation, which now owns TED and runs it as a not-for-profit. Prior to that, TED was a very profitable private business, and it could be a far more profitable one today. But instead of distributing profits to shareholders, it converts them into engines of idea dissemination. And the spread of its meticulously curated ideas are the dividends TED pays to its owners, who are in a sense all of us and none of us because nobody owns TED. Chris will tell us about the remarkable organization he's built. But much more interesting to me, we'll dive deep into his philosophy about how human minds are wired and the power of ingenious oratory, which is suddenly making a surprise comeback after centuries of semi-dormancy. We'll also discuss why he believes, as we just heard him state, that the imminent influx of billions of less privileged people into the internet is perhaps the biggest social experiment we've ever undertaken. I'll add that after some polite kicking and screaming, Chris also shares his fascinating personal history. Unusually for someone with two English parents, one of them an eye surgeon, Chris spent much of his childhood in a mud hut in Pakistan. Yes, I'm serious, and it only got more interesting from there. Before we start, two quick points of disclosure. First, as you may have detected, I'm suffering from the tail end of a cold. And if that isn't obvious yet, it will be in the main body of the interview, which we recorded two days ago, when I was a little bit further from the end of my cold than I am now. I apologize if I sound like I'm holding my nose at times, but my diction is understandable, so the only real damage from this was to my ego. Second, I'd like to disclose that I've known Chris for most of my adult life, and he's a very important friend to me. We've also worked together on things professionally. To give but two of many examples, I helped Chris brainstorm and create a magazine called Business 2.0, and he was one of the first investors in my startup, Listen.com, which eventually created the Rhapsody Music Service. I make no attempt to hide my admiration for Chris or for any of my guests under a veneer of journalistic neutrality. That's because I'm not a journalist, and this podcast isn't journalism. It's rather my attempt to introduce you to extraordinary thinkers, founders, and scientists, and their ideas and stories. So by definition, I think everyone I have on the show is awesome, And as you'll now discover, Chris is no exception to this. So Chris, it's wonderful as always to be here in Ted's New York offices. I guess they're now new-ish rather than brand new, aren't they? Yes, we've been here 18 months now. 18 months, that feels new-ish. And I'll note that the look and the feel and the energy of this place always feels much more like that of a startup than of most of the not-for-profits that I've visited over the years. I like that. Yes, I think that's right. 
we have lots of webby type activity going on, lots of people creating, lots of people editing, lots of people running around wondering what exactly they should be doing. <laughs> um, and uh, I think there's good, there's good startup energy here, yes. Yeah, it definitely has that. Now, just set a little bit of context for the listeners who are the least familiar with TED. I'd love it if you could give us a quick elevator pitch describing TED and its mission. And it's totally fair to presume that we're on a very slow elevator in a very tall building, if you wish. TED's mission is to catalyze humans' biggest superpower. Humans have this incredible, weird capability of being able to pattern the world in their minds and then improve on that pattern, make better worlds, simulate better worlds, and bizarrely be able to communicate them to other humans. And, uh, and TED's mission is to encapsulate that communication and try to amplify it as far as it can go in the belief that um, that's how you, you know, maybe nudge the world to, to a better place. TED used to be a conference that covered technology, entertainment, and design, which is the TED. And then it slowly, those subjects that got covered got broader and broader because what people understood was that the magic of TED was not the, uh, those specific subjects, but the fact that you were learning stuff from outside your normal field. And, and there's no reason to stop at three subjects. You know, TED Talks, one way of thinking of them is that they are people's attempts to make their knowledge accessible across normal dividing lines. Um, and, um, and because all knowledge is connected, it's actually really helpful to emerge from your trench from time to time and see the connections of your trench with other trenches. Yeah, I imagine if you took all the topics that are well addressed in TED Talks and strung them into an acronym, it would be like an eight syllable word at this point. So <laughs> sticking with TED is probably a good idea. Does it actually, I never thought of this, does it no longer officially stand for technology, entertainment and design? No, it officially stands for those, those three things. But um there's definitely lots of science in there and lots of business and global issues and cultural issues and so forth. Yes, everything. The eight syllable word. So, eight syllable. So just a couple quick headline facts to contextualize things. Of course, people know TED. A lot of people know TED primarily for the TED Talks that are all over the mm -hmm. internet. Roughly how many views do those talks get in the course of a year? Well, if you include views and listens, because we have podcasts at TED Radio Hour and so forth. And if you include TEDx as well as TED and TED Ed, which is our educational videos, I think our run rate is about two and a half billion uh, a year right now. And uh, the number of staff, it's about 200, correct? Correct. And there is one, uh, one thing that a lot of folks don't realize, there is the one main quote unquote official TED event every year. Uh, thousands of TEDx events, which we'll talk about in a moment because they're absolutely fascinating. And then occasionally there's a second quote unquote official event that's international, correct? Correct. TED Global. And, uh, and then there's TED Women. And then there's quite a few salons and so forth that we, we put on. So the other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, and even to, to my surprise, even some, some TED attendees, is that even though you bought TED with money you had earned in your business career, you've structured it in such a way that TED is owned by nobody, or more accurately, it's owned by a foundation, and it doesn't distribute its profits to anybody. That's correct. Yes, it's, it's a, a foundation that I set up in the 90s, and it's, yeah, its purpose is for the public good, so... Uh, I don't make money from it. And and actually, it's turned out to be a surprisingly useful part of Ted's, Ted's growth because surprisingly makes m far more people eager and excited to work with you. And, and that's, that's actually been the, the secret source of Ted. It's been, it's been thousands and thousands of people from around the world wanting to help advance the mission in some way, whether as translators or as TEDx organizers, um, or indeed just as free marketers. Like people have been passionate about advancing certain talks and, and, uh, and speakers, of course, who come, they don't get paid either. They, they basically come because they want to share their ideas. And I don't think any of that would have happened quite the way it happened if we were just if we were a business and people would be going yeah this is good it's a platform but but um it's kind of annoying that um chris is getting rich off it or whatever um, i think i think it would slow it down and you certainly wouldn't get as much free labor because it's a rare business that benefits from the work of tens to hundreds of thousands of volunteers so to review that amazing achievement let's start with the translation side of ted how many volunteer translators would you say you have i mean i think active Translators right now, more than 20,000. More than 20,000. And these are people who basically create uh, text translations. Do you do any overdubbing or is it all text translations still? 
It's been text translation so far, but we are looking hard now at dubbing. Yeah, so it's 20,000 people who put it, I'm, I'm sure, hundreds of languages across all those people. Yeah, there's, there's more than 100 languages. And, you know, when you think that there's, there's two and a half thousand TED Talks in the, in the main library times up to 100 languages, that, that's, a, that's a lot of hours of translation that someone has to do. They work in pairs, actually. It's an interesting model. They work in pairs. They check each other's work. And um, we found that the quality of those translations is as good or better than professionally translated work. So aside from the fact that it would have broken us if we'd had to pay for all those translations, uh, it, I, I think the actual end result has been better too. And involving far more volunteers than even that are the TEDx events. And there are what, 3,500 of those a year? Something like that. About 10 every day somewhere in the world. And for those who have not yet attended one uh, or aren't clear on the difference between TEDx and regular TED, uh, describe what TEDx is. So the X means it's a self-organized event. We basically give a free license to people who apply. That's We probably about a third or so of the people who apply get the license. And they, they make the case that they are well set up to organize a local event and bring in a community and they're willing to sign up for the, to do it using the TED format. Essentially, they don't make money from it. They, they do it from their own passion. And, um, and the amazing thing is that uh, some of these events are attracting thousands of people. There's one in Buenos Aires that 10,000 people come to the Sydney opera house has been packed out. And then, they decided that that wasn't big enough. So, so the TEDx Sydney, I think it's oh, four or 5,000 people go to that one. Uh, and then it's all the way across to places where it's surprising that there are TED-like events like Kabul and Baghdad and... San Quentin, right? San Quentin, yes, indeed. There have been quite a few TEDx events held in jails. And some of those are actually the most in inspiring. You know, I, I had a letter once from a prisoner who said, you know, I've just been to this TEDx event. Um, thank you. And by the way, it was the most inspiring day of my life. Asterisk, not my life in jail, my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was very touching. And with 3,500 events, that's what hundreds of thousands of volunteers. Although I guess it's size dependent. How big is the average TEDx? They vary in size. Some literally have a team of 40 or 50 people doing them. Some are probably just two or three people. I think I put a more conservative number, but it's probably fifty to a hundred thousand. But it's still it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Thirty five hundred events. I've been to a handful of them. They are extremely ambitious. The ones that I've been to are extravagantly well produced. What is the total staff here in New York or full full time staff of TED that oversee and de facto enable those thirty five hundred events to occur on your side? Mm, last time I checked, uh, eighteen. And that just blows my mind from a leverage standpoint. I mean, managing that many events with such a tiny staff is a profoundly audacious act, not least because you're taking a huge brand risk, because you're you're literally allowing thousands of people that your staff could never possibly meet in person um, to operate under your name and your logo. And God knows what crazy things the hundreds of thousands of people they recruit might just say on a camera <laughs> that ends up on the internet. But it's impossible to argue with the reach all of this has gotten you. I certainly think it's been it's been exciting to see the growth and you're yeah. right that it it did represent brand risk and there have been uh, a few uh, truly embarrassing TEDx talks that have that have taken place the the surprise has been how many of them haven't been that they've been they've been awesome and how motivated people even though they're, they're volunteers have been to do things the right way it's been a journey in that events that were maybe a bit shaky the first time they were held, got better over time. That there's, there's a sort of, this community self-teaches. Um, they learn from each other. We invest uh, a bit in trying to bring them together, trying to disseminate materials to them and give, you know, give them all the knowledge yeah. we, we can. And I really think we've seen over the years, you know, the, the, the talks get better each time. And now suddenly, I would say in the last year, TEDx has reached a kind of critical mass where if you look at the, the graph of views of TEDx talks on YouTube, um, so we don't, we, many of them we don't have on our main site. They're, they're posted on YouTube currently. And there's about, I think we've just crossed the 100,000th 
you, uh, TEDx talk on YouTube. Unique talk. Unique talks. Two hundred. Wow. So that's compared to two and a half thousand on our main site. So yeah. it's forty x. But if you look at the views graph, it's it's suddenly bent upwards and to the right. You know, up and away. It's that sort of beautiful J curve that um, any entrepreneur or media person craves. Which because what it's telling you is there is organic growth here. Suddenly, um, the good people viewing YouTube are getting more and more excited about watching these these TEDx talks, which once were sort of the, the if you like, the poor cousin of TED. I, I think they're fast becoming the engine of TED. And if you follow the trend up in a few years' time, it may be that far more TEDx talks are viewed than TED talks. So these these are talks that we, the TED organization, have not we have not hired the speaker, coached the speaker, really don't necessarily even believe in what the speaker's saying every time. But we have a local organizer who does believe in that speaker and who has worked with them. And, and the results are, are starting to look amazing. Yeah. Well, what's extraordinary about it as well is, um, first of all, that number, 100,000 unique talks. I mean, you think of the different layers of people who are impacted by that. Uh, the biggest and broadest layer are going to be all the uncountable millions of people who see them online. Um, the second circle are going to be the uncountable, also probably in the millions of people, surely in the millions, who have seen them in person. But on top of that, as somebody who's, who, who once gave a TED Talk, the 100,000 speakers get a priceless gift as well. I mean, there is something, and I'm sure it's every bit as terrifying to stand up on you know the stage at TED Zurich as at Maine's TED. No matter what, you're in front of a large number of people who are expecting something brilliant from you. And the process of crafting a message and really distilling as coherently, concise, concisely, and persuasively as you can something of intense interest to you is something that a hundred thousand people get to experience. And then you pivot to, you know, the thousands of organizers. I'm sure for most of the people who put on these 3,500 events, it's the main event of their year. Mm. And that's a, can be an incredibly engaging, inspiring, stressful, et cetera thing. And then the, you know, the way that they touch the communities. I mean, there's so many circles that get touched by that. And it's the fact that it radiates from 18 people. It just, it never ceases to astound me. I mean, there are so many things that are possible in the internet age that just weren't possible before. I mean, Wikipedia is a nutso idea, okay. like fancy having a, a, a an encyclopedia that anyone can edit. It's a recipe for a disaster. And yet, you know, it's become the top Google search result for almost any topic you type in. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary gl global resource and it's done, it's fueled by people inspired by the mission and connected together on, on, online. And, uh, and yeah, TEDx is, is in its own way is, is something like that. I guess it's helped. It's helped cement in our minds the notion that the all of the good things that have happened at TED have happened when we decided to give something away. Mm -hmm. You know, in this case, it was our brand. Um, before that, it was it was the decision to give away our content online, which was quite radical. And, and I want to dive into that in a moment. But first, I'd like to rewind to your first encounter with TED. What struck you about TED when you first came as an attendee back in, what was it, 1998? And who were you at that point career-wise? Right. So I was a media entrepreneur. I had some magazines and websites and um, was invited by a friend, my dear friend, Sonny Bates, to, who's one of the world's great connectors, uh, to come to TED in 98. And uh, I went and uh, I fell in love with it. I, I had this powerful sense of having come home and like meeting people who were dreamers and who got excited about big ideas, even if they initially seemed a little crazy. Um, um, and, and I found that, that the weirdness of hearing subject matter outside the normal things I was used to. I mean, normally when you go to a conference, you just, you know, it'd be like, for me, it would be a magazine conference. You learn about one thing. Um, so hearing software engineers and designers and architects and so forth, it was, it was jolting initially. And, and the weird thing was that by the, about the third day, dots connected that you just didn't expect. You would hear what one speaker said, and suddenly you'd make a, a sort of conceptual connection to something that was said two days earlier in a completely different field. And, and then it would suddenly, you would think, oh, and that actually could help me do something differently at work. I might try that. And then there was the human side of it. One of the speakers was Amy Mullins, um, who's, you know, literally unscrewed her leg on stage and replaced it and get told this extraordinary story of, of how she, as an athlete, she had felt empowered by, um, these, these artificial legs that, you know, she had, and I was sitting at the back 
tears pouring down my face. And I, I realized why people there were saying, this is the most important week of my year. And as a media entrepreneur, for one thing, that got my attention. When you, when you see that much passion about something, you, you, that's a really big clue that there's, there's something special there. And yeah, three years later, I, you know, I had a chance to buy it uh, and seized it. So from the end of 2001, I you know, was, had this sort of slightly terrifying prospect of taking over Ted and make it work myself. And I'm sure it was all the more terrifying because it was such an awful time for business in and around tech. And your own businesses were no exception. Having spent 15 years in, as an entrepreneur building a big company that became a public company with 150 magazines, 2,000 employees, magazines like PC Gamer and Business 2.0 and, and many others that were deeply boring to everyone except for the people they were aimed at who loved them. Yeah. Um, the dot-com crash crushed this company in, in 2000, 2001. And... Um, uh, we had to close a bunch of magazines. I had to fire essentially a thousand people, like half the half the workforce. Yeah, and it was it was utterly heartbreaking, devastating. I moved from thinking of myself as a great entrepreneur to thinking of myself as a complete loser. Um, and I literally was a loser because like ninety eight percent of my net worth or whatever, you know, evaporated, smoked away in the span of about a year. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like every day, it was just more more bad news. It was it was, and a lot of people at that time who were in the technology business had had a similar experience. Oh, everybody it, did. A lot of people, including a lot of people at TED, like people literally, it was unusual to find someone who hadn't lost 90% of their net worth. Admittedly, a lot of that net worth was paper and ridiculous and inflated at the time. But Or started at large enough mum numbers that still was, that, 10% that it was, was okay-ish. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. well, in, well, in, well, indeed. Yeah. But, but I, I thought I was in danger of actually going personally bankrupt for, for various reasons. And, and um, it was... And the fun of, I mean, just, you know, what had been a really thrilling entrepreneurial ride was no longer fun. Managing decline is not very much in my DNA. And, um, and I, frankly, I think I'm a, I was a pretty terrible CEO of a public company anyway. Um, and, um, and so Ted, you know, I had this, I had this foundation that I was trying that, you know, when I'd sold, you know, part of the business. And, you know, I had a, some money and I put money in and uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with it anyway that would do some damn good. Cause it's, it's surprisingly hard to spend money philanthropically and have it actually turn into something. So Ted seemed like this, well, you know, make, I mean, ideas, they can be really powerful. Um, that this could be the thing, but the thought of going all in with it, and, uh, and failing still felt pretty risky. So the purchase was made with a foundation, with a nonprofit. And it turned out that that, as I indicated earlier, that was actually one of the keys to getting the transition to work. Because what it meant I could say to the TED community, who were deeply skeptical of this awkward Brit coming in, replacing an extremely charismatic founder, um, I could say, look, I, I'm doing this for us. This, this, this meeting matters too much to all of us we can't let it just go away because the founders moved on. Let's keep it going together. My job is to hold on to the values of it and to see where it will go run by kind of by all of us rather than just by, by one person and run to try and make a difference to the world at large. So that was the gamble. And it was still, it was a very, there was, um, there was a period in there where it wasn't clear that it would actually work. Initially, no one signed up to the first conference I ran, etc. And that's scary because it was, it, even back then, it was a thing that, generally speaking, people signed up for a year in advance for the bulk of folks, right? Not all, but... <laughs> correct. 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 And, so. um, and that definitely did not happen when I, when I took over. So it was, it was a scary time. Oh, and throw in the fact that the whole, you know, everyone was feeling beat up, beaten up around about then just because of the, the dot-com crash. I mean, everyone in technology and associated was um, uh, rethinking everything. I had one chance, actually, to speak to the TED community and try and make my case and say, this is how it's going to be. This is the dream. This is the vision. This is why we should keep it going. And I'm not a great public speaker. I, I was nervous, lots of ums and ahs, but I, <laughs> I sort of sat on the stage. I was too nervous to stand. I sat on a chair and um, kind of tried to say, but look, it's worth going and told my story and, and why I was passionate about ideas and how actually during the whole trauma of the dot-com crash, what had saved me was reading again and rediscovering how much amazing 
thought had happened in the last 10 years that I couldn't pass me by. And there's just been amazing developments in psychology and philosophy in, in technology that I, I was not up with. And I'd got so excited reading it. And, and I, I, the thought of being able to celebrate those I, ideas just was really exciting. And I don't know, something, something, I think what happened in that moment was that a few people in the community realized that they didn't want a world without this conference that yeah. they've been going to. Um, and so like Jeff Bezos, for example, was sat in the third row, I think. Um, and after I sat down from what was honestly uh, an awkward talk, you can see it online and see just how awkward it was. But he stood up and a few people stood up and, started, and then suddenly the whole room was clapping and cheering. And it was like, we're going to do this. And that was the moment where I knew that Ted was going to be okay and that the, the transition would eventually happen. And and in the hour after that talk, like 300 people signed up and the and the whole you know, we were good to go. Wow. It, it, it is, it is, I hadn't really thought until now, what a big deal the transition to the foundation surely was because it had been a for-profit endeavor and, and people know that conferences, particularly sex, successful ones are extremely profitable endeavors. And so to make that transition in front of a group of people who had been going to Ted at that point for 10 or 15 years, right? I mean, it was a well-established event yes. with people who were passionate about it and had been going to it for a long time. So that is quite a gigantic change, the change to not-for-profit. And I'm sure that helped an enormous amount. Well, it, it certainly helped with, with some people. We, um, I mean, I think some people we definitely lost anyway. Oh, sure. But there was enough there to, to get the thing going and to attract uh, new attendees. And, and uh, the journey since then has truly been thrilling. I mean, it's been, it's been an amazing ride to, to, watch, to watch how things have unfolded. Well, before we get to that part of the discussion, if you don't mind, because um, you and I go back a ways, <laughs> I feel like your personal story, your personal history has you know, impacted your philosophy and has had a great deal to do with some of the decisions that you've made since you've taken over, Ted. Would you mind uh, just if we speak a little bit about that personal history? If you don't think you're going to put everyone to sleep, then sure, let's do that. I think we'll that. keep them wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> the the first thing I, I do like to go back in some cases to the beginning. And one thing that most people upon meeting you wouldn't necessarily guess to look at you is that you were born in a small village in Pakistan, correct? Yes, I was born in Pakistan. It was actually Shikarpur. It's a, it's a town. Um, and then grew up in a mud hut in a very small um, village, really more like um, a hospital clinic. It was, it was a mobile hospital in a kind of compound uh, where my father worked. He was an ophthalmologist. He was a missionary. And he thought, you know, by offering cataract surgery and other procedures in the Sindh desert in Pakistan, um, he was, he was bringing God's love to, uh, to, to the Muslim people and giving them a chance at salvation. And giving them a chance at salvation by working on conversions to Christianity, I assume. Correct. That's, yeah. That was, that was, uh, his dream. And yeah. he was, and throughout your childhood, you were in and around uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, a bit of India as well. Am I right? Yeah. So, so they worked. My parents worked in Pakistan and then Afghanistan, and they they sent us to boarding school in India in this beautiful, beautiful hill station in the Himalayas, overlooking, you know, there was seven thousand feet up and looking down over the plains and playing on the hillsides. There, it was, it was actually a spectacular place to go to school, and it was an international school. I think that's that's probably helped shape me quite a bit. Um, you go to school with kids from 30 countries and you, you kind of end up with just seeing the world differently. Like you still have all the sort of, um, you know, fights and whatever that you have in any school, but, but they're not about color or, or country of origin. They're about, um, you know, whose girlfriend, who gets the beautiful girlfriend and so forth, but all, all those what things. People compete about in schools throughout the world. <laughs> and I'm sure at that point, you really, you didn't have a distinct country of origin. I mean, your parents were English. Uh, both of them were English? C correct. Yeah. And, but you had grown up your, the vast majority of your life until you went to university was spent in Central Asia, correct? Um, I went to boarding school in England oh, when I did. was 14. When you yeah. were 14. Yeah. But until that moment, uh, you would have certainly had a, a home country notionally. You had had a passport. You grew up with uh, no small amount of English culture. But you were surrounded by, by, by other cultures throughout. Yeah, I was definitely confused. I, I, uh, well, like when I was in England um, and the England Indian cricket team came to visit, I was cheering for the Indian cricket team. They were my, my heroes. And, um, and I actually... I don't think that's unhealthy in the end. Like I, if I, if 
every kid grew up that way. Everyone would just be a global soul naturally. And uh, a lot of the things we argue about would actually go away. And I, I do think that when I came to TED, it helped. It, it's no surprise, given that upbringing, that part of my uh, mission there was to try and glo globalize TED a bit more and make it make it not just an American thing, but something for the world. Well, there's there's the globalization of TED, which has been very very distinct with TEDx and everything else. Uh, but there is also a, a certain missionary fervor. Um, I I will add as somebody who's been to TED many times and feels that strongly and oh dear. <laughs> and loves that about TED. So you're obviously your folks were missionary. Religion was a very big part of your upbringing. Then, oh, a huge part. Um, my parents were Bible believing Christians, you know, born again. They believed that the key to someone's eternity was what they believed. And therefore they felt an overwhelming moral obligation that the only thing that actually mattered in life was to try to persuade people to believe the right things, to believe in Jesus to and fix to fix their eternity, to fix their eternity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your, your, your eternal destiny, heaven or hell depended on what you believed. And, and so they felt urgency about it and passion about it and um, had no patience for people who were religious, but not evangelical. Interesting. Um, because that felt like a complete cop out and, um, you know, not, ta not taking the faith seriously. Let's talk about your dad, because I know what he was working as an ophthalmologist throughout doing surgeries and so forth. For every minute he spent uh, successfully persuading people to convert to Christianity, he probably spent many hours performing surgery and delivering medical care to poor people. Yeah, so it was it was a complex activity. I think like he felt he was bringing, showing God's love, and and part of that was probably, especially early on, that was like a means to an end. You know, this is the way that I'll persuade people that to become a Christian. I think as he as he later on in life, he just saw actually the delivering of the love as the as the end, and uh, and that that was the powerful thing. And he changed completely. I think his his view of how to think of of Muslims. Um, he made many. Muslim friends, deep Muslim friends in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, they both did. And um, who, people who they viewed as deeply spiritual. And so that there was this huge shift, I think, in their own thinking that actually Muslims and Christians worship the same God. They, they just have a different name for it. And that shift, I've, I've, I read a letter recently from him that I think to other evangelicals at the time would have seemed very radical, mm. make, just making that that case that we're thinking about Islam wrong. And I, in a way, if, you, if I could take his view of Islam and inject it into the minds of, for example, the Christian right today in America, for example, I, I think it would actually make a big, big impact because there's, it's, it's a fundamentally a bridging view, not, not a conquer them, convert them view. And it's unsurprising that spending decades delivering care and, and living amongst folks in, you know, in their societies and their cultures would result in a bridging perspective over time. And, but so you came to the UK at 14 as a student mm. with two, at least two pieces of heritage from this. Well, three, we have the passion for Indian cricket, significant, mm. probably controversial amongst your new <laughs> schoolmates. Um, we certainly have the global soul, but also at that point, a very devout soul when you first came to England and for quite some time after that? Yeah, I was, I was a believer. I was Christian. I was passionate about it. I read C.S. Lewis, who gave me a way to frame Christianity that seemed deeply m meaningful. Uh, it kind of gave it more like a sort of cosmic, it, you know, it made, it made sense in a way that traditional Sunday school type teaching of Christianity did not. And uh, so I was, I was in, absolutely. And um, I went to Oxford to study philosophy and even through that, tried to bridge, you know, tried uh, the, the, the philosophical problem I couldn't solve at, at Oxford um, was in moral philosophy, which was how could someone who didn't believe in God have any kind of morality? What, why, if, if you believed essentially that we were here because we, we'd been, you know, thrown together by the universe through a process of evolution and that was it, what possible answer would you have for someone who said, look, I'm going to live my life, do the things I want to do. Why should I do anything else? Go away. And I, I couldn't imagine any logical argument to that person. And so, so for me, I think the deepest motivation to just hold on to this belief in God, apart from the fact that anyone who's grown up religious, you almost feel like you, you know, you have a relationship. It's, it's a very personal thing, but it was that belief that, that all of the good in the world was somehow anchored to a belief in God. Without that, um, there was no protection against the world dissolving into 
uh, cynicism, anarchy, and uh, you, ultimately, you know, sort of chaos and, and selfishness. And you sustained that that viewpoint through university, correct? And then it was later than that that it started to change for you, or was it in university that it did? I mean, it was all the time. So many questions. There's so much about our version of Christianity that was fundamentally puzzling, like you know, the belief that God was looking after every minute, had everything planned, nothing happened that he didn't know about, the future was completely known, and yet th there were all these horrible things happening in the world. What? How could you make sense of those two things? And I, I noticed that a lot of Christians would shift depending on what they were talking about. It would either be, you know, something good happened and it's, yes, God is looking after you and he knows every detail about you. Something bad happened and that would be, oh, that was that was the devil or that was that was human free will at play. Um, but God still knows every detail of the future. Well, if he knows every detail of the future, then is that will really free? And, you know, these, these things were very hard to reconcile and, and definitely questions the whole way through. It sounds but, yeah, like it almost flirted with Calvinism um, with that predestination and, and so forth. I mean, flirted with, lot, yes, lot, lots of different beliefs. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately just, I, I think the biggest single struggle was this question of evil, how you, how you dealt with evil in the world. And, and as, as you, you know, start leaving university, you enter life and you see more and more things happen. That, that question got more and more intense. I also saw that many of the people I most respected who were, who were doing the best stuff in the world weren't that religious. And uh, that was a surprise and, and uh, gave pause for thought. And so, yeah, in, in my late twenties, I finally, um, and for me, like it felt very dramatic at the moment, but I said, I can't believe this anymore. This version of Christianity at any rate, um, I'm out. I'm no longer going to church. Um, I'm going to go on my own path. And that was a day that that happened. There was a specific day and time when that final decision was reached. Yeah, yeah, it was. I was walking by a canal and something just clicked and I thought, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> and at this point, we'll we'll cover this very briefly because we want to get back to Ted. But this was when you had by then you had started your magazine business, correct? That's correct. I just started publishing uh, the first, my first computer magazine, borrowed some money, started an entrepreneurial business, and uh, that was that was definitely exciting. And possibly a psychologist would say that the confidence that came from that gave me the confidence to make this other leap as well. I don't know. And it was a magazine about the computer of the future, the uh, Amstrad, that famous home computer, the Amstrad, that only people in England ever, ever heard about. Um, it was one of three popular formats at the time, the third of the third most popular. And there weren't, you know, computer magazines were exploding. Yeah, yeah. I got to edit one and I uh, was wildly excited about home computers. Um, and so, yeah, there was that, there seemed like there was an opportunity on this one to on try and publish a magazine. And it, well, the other two were what, Amiga? And what was the third no, one? No, it wasn't actually Amiga. At the time it was, it was the Sinclair. Oh, right. It was another very, um, wobbly, dodgy, <laughs> British made computer. And then there, there, there were imported there were couple, com yeah. uh, American computers like the Apple and I think the BBC had a computer and there was a few other things kicking around. The BBC had a computer. They did. They You're did. kidding. They, yeah, they distributed a computer for a few years in, wow. in the UK. That is interesting. Uh, so to just uh, not, not, I mean, we could probably talk about <laughs> future publishing for quite a while because it's an interesting story, but to race through it, uh, you grew to 35 titles over the better part of a decade. And you came to the U.S. basically, you sold Future and came to the U.S. essentially to replicate that model in the United States, correct? That's basically right. It was, it was, it was a wonderful time to be publishing magazines. It was, they were kind of the internet of the time. Um, these specialist magazines, you couldn't, if you were, if you wanted to get knowledge about something, um, a specialist magazine was your source. And believe it or not, people used to actually, you know, on the publication date, people would run to the newsagent to buy the magazine. They were excited to get it. And it was also the time when suddenly it was possible to produce those magazines vastly cheaper than ever before because of desktop publishing, essentially. Um, so those two things together was, uh, I didn't really see it at the time, but it was, it was, it, it was incredibly fortunate and good time to be launching magazines. You could actually, in the UK at any rate, launch them out of their own cash flow. So there weren't, we didn't have outside investors. Wow. We were literally growing this business out of its own cash flow and it was sort of doubling every year. And then you and I met, I guess, a few years after you came over to the U.S. to replicate your model here. And by the time we crossed paths, despite being mainly in print publishing, you were quite an internet obsessive. Right. 
Well, as as uh, as you may know, your your book Architects of the Web was one of the things to blame for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Rob wrote a book that was one of the early sort of thought pieces, I would say, on the internet that that spoke to a bunch of the early pioneers and extracted from them why they were so excited about this thing and explained it in a way that would would ignite any anyone who was interested in media or or, or you know. Or, startup businesses or whatever um, would ignite their thinking and it certainly ignited mine and I demanded that we had lunch and we had lunch and and um, and then you made me pay for it which was crazy no you didn't I'm kidding <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would pay for that lunch again yeah. that, was, that was a great great lunch that was the beginning yeah. of, uh, of a lot of exciting things because we did work together um, on brainstorming the idea of a new magazine which became business 2.0 which was a magnificent magazine <laughs> I think it, it was played, it definitely played a huge role uh, puffing hot air into the bubble of, uh, of the. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still think it was a wonderful magazine. It was a wonderful it, magazine. It got very fat very quickly. It, it was, did. It fat was, being with page with advertising pages. Correct. Very well. That was a time when all kinds of technical and entrepreneurial magazines were doing very well in the late nineties. And then the other thing that came out, which is very important at the time and to this day, because literally hundreds of millions of people use this site that you started, IGM. IGN. It started out, I think it was called affiliation.com. Affiliation, it, it, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the yeah. idea was in the internet age, you don't have to control and own everything yourself. You can let others do the hard work and, and you just connect them and be the, the kind of uh, the convener, the connector. And so the idea was to gather a bunch of sites about video games and other other related topics. Because you had magazines that dealt with video games and therefore an audience and content. Co co correct, and could promote it. And, uh, and so that, that was the original idea. And yes, it became, it became more of a clear focus on just on the video game part, which is the most successful part of it. So it got renamed IGN uh, Internet. Internet, internet gaming network and sometimes we'd say internet generation network i think that we but yes i think it's what, right. whatever it was it is colossal i believe it is overwhelmingly the most popular gaming site online right now um and it eventually it went public it was public for a period of time eventually news corp bought it etc it's had a it's had a very interesting history so back to ted thank you for that that detour because i do think that a few things i think the missionary background the international background and that sense of depth that existed solely, really, in magazines at that time, and I hadn't thought about this until right now, but you did come along just at the time of the desktop publishing revolution, which was when magazines could suddenly become much smaller in terms of circulation and therefore much deeper in terms of niche and therefore collect a much more passionate group of people. It really was, in a lot of ways, the prototype of the World Wide Web. And you were dabbling in it for, for all those years. Uh, but then, as we talked about, the bubble burst. It was that tremendously challenging time. You put an enormous amount uh, on the line for TED, not least that you had this room of incredibly influential people who believed so fervently in this thing. And then they're like, who's got the ball, right? It's like mm. being the, the person who's running for the end zone <laughs> with the ball. And it's like, is, is he going to fumble it? If, if he is, we're, we're never going to let him forget it. <laughs> and there were, there were, as we talked about, a couple of seminal decisions, the first one being to buy TED. Uh, we talked about TEDx, which came a little later. But in the middle, we have this fascinating decision to put videos online in 2006. Why was that a terrifying decision? Well, people, you know, the whole revenue for TED was from conference passes, which were expensive. And um, we thought, and people, if you asked them, would have said that the re reason they went to TED was to listen to great talks. That so couldn't you, be heard anywhere else. That couldn't be heard anywhere else. And um, so if you're going to give them all away, you're kind of um, risking giving away the crown jewels and, and going rapidly to zero, going out in a big bang. And, and if certainly a few people th told us... It, be really careful about this stone. This is risky. But I think in 2005, we had, um, we had a, there was a whole series of TED Talks about the sort of changing rules around media online. So people, speakers like Clay Shirky, Kevin Kelly, um, Howard Rheingold, you know, talking about um, how the web was allowing collaboration in a special way and how, you know, letting go of stuff like people, the, the more you could, you could just connect people and um, not impose top-down rules but allow bottom-up thinking the better you would do and these were talks that were being delivered on the ted stage that, 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 that's right yeah and um they, they were powerful and so we listened to that and it just it just from a bunch of sources it seemed like it would be an exciting experiment just to try 
giving away the content. We'd been we'd been looking for a way to get the content out there on on TV, and and then that model we assumed TV companies would pay us a fortune to you know have this wonderful content and and share it. And TV didn't want to do that. They thought lectures were actually quite boring. And um, I don't know if they ever watched them, but um, <laughs> talking heads not a good idea. So we we completely failed in that effort. But in two thousand six. Just as online video made it possible, albeit in a very low res, shaky kind of way, made it possible to to stream talks online. We tried giving away six of them, and to our astonishment, found that people loved them. Yeah, and it just was it. It wasn't clear that they would work outside the room. That just you know, on a, on a few inches of square inches of real estate on the corner of your computer screen, which is all that one had which for is video in two thousand and six. Kind yeah. of, pretty much what you had. Yeah, this, these were the days of the briefest and lowest quality cat videos ever. I mean, it, that was <laughs> it, it. Was that that it was thirty second cat videos it was almost all you could see, and you'd wait forever for it to show up. And people love those cat videos, and we thought. Then, and, and the assumption was that that would be most of what online video would be. So, so to so to get emails from people who'd been genuinely moved by these talks. That was really the key turning point, I would say, in, in Ted's story. One, one email I, I just always struck me, there was just um, someone saying, I'm looking at my computer screen and I'm crying watching this talk. Uh, another one said, you, you have just enabled me to have the best conversation I had with my daughter in 10 years. Wow. And so this isn't, this isn't just like, not like this was, or this was transformative in a way. So that made it, even though the numbers at that stage, I mean, the numbers were, were pleasing, but they weren't amazing. We'd gone from like a thousand visits a day to 10,000. And surprisingly, they hadn't really trailed off much. They were actually, if anything, continuing to grow, but it became, it was clear from the, the tone of the response within three weeks of that experiment that we had to turn Ted on its head and, and, and not think of ourselves as a conference, but think of ourselves as an engine to distribute ideas. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah, so the plan was then within a few months to, we actually felt urgency because it, it was clear that someone was going to do this. We felt urgency to quickly create a site. We came up with this uh, mission of ideas worth spreading. Oh, and, that was with the video. Is that, that's, that was the with term. the videos. Yeah. That, that was with the videos. Yeah, that makes and so sense. we were in a race to try and get a site that could distribute a hundred videos, um, to as many people as possible. And again, this is the thing that makes Ted kind of fascinating to me. It does feel a lot like a startup around here, as I noted earlier, because people are focused on a lot of startup like metrics. You know, how many views have we had? How many people have we reached today? That kind of thing. But it isn't because you're maximizing dollars to distribute to shareholders. It's because it, it's all about spreading the ideas and you can measure it in some very quantitative manners the number of ideas that have gone out and how widely they've spread. And it is intriguing also that you, the, the trade-off that you were facing at the very beginning, we're effectively going to have our conference goers subsidize the distribution of Ted's ideas to all the non-conference goers. I mean, that was the fear that maybe people would react negatively to that. Um, that is in fact what happens to this day. And I think that most attendees at TED feel extraordinarily good about the fact that they know that their dollars are, are going to disseminating ideas. I'm going to be cautiously cite public sources because because you and I go back, I probably I may know a few things about TED's finances that aren't entirely public. So uh, Fortune in 2015 said that TED's overall revenues were about $66 million. And um, uh, I understand from uh, other sources that really it's the conference that makes the money and it funds all those other things that that spread the wide dissemination of ideas. Is that is that a fair way of phrasing it? Yeah, that is basically correct. That um, that that community that comes um, are, are the means by which we can kind of you know create the website and the other distribution operation which 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 costs many tens of millions of dollars and um you know to get to get to the kind of scale that's that's needed and it's been yeah it's actually been surprising wildly surprising how enthusiastically people have been to encourage that they haven't it turns out they didn't mind at all they actually uh, people 
even people who've been coming and used to tell us an exclusive thing with a few exceptions have, have been cheering, cheering this on and been excited to share talks with their friends and colleagues and so forth. And, and the interesting thing as well is um, you not only direct all of the money that would otherwise be accruing to an otherwise very profitable business to finance the spreading of ideas through a diversity of mechanisms. We'll talk about some of the non-website ones in a moment. But on top of that, in the context of the website where so many people encounter the ideas, you've made a lot of deliberate decisions that a for-profit company would never make. Uh, you have no pre-rolls, for instance, and very, very little advertising. I assume that those are deliberate decisions to reduce the friction between people and ideas? That's correct. You know, the, the mission is to share ideas freely to everyone. So, so the least you can put in the way of that, the, the better. Absolutely. That's, that's the idea. And, and the other, the other thing about the other problem about having too much uh, dependence on advertising is that, is that it makes people suspicious about who's really behind these ideas. Yeah. It's, it's really important that ideas are there are being shared just because they are great ideas, not because it's, it's in someone's financial interest to produce a specific idea. And so that's, that's very much the operating philosophy. And then you have all these, these mechanisms to basically invest this bounty that were you a company would be, if you just kept it at the corporate dollars and the, the conference tickets, it would be violently profitable, particularly if you maximize the website for revenue as opposed to the dissemination of ideas. But so you do have this, the surplus that comes from these things. We've talked about this juggernaut that is TEDx. TED-Ed is another thing that's quite interesting that takes up quite a few resources. Would you care to describe TED-Ed real briefly and what people could do there? Right. So TED-Ed is our initiative. Uh, aimed at kids basically it's takes the shape of about five minute five minute ish videos that are animated um so the idea is really to to seed curiosity um i guess our view of education is that it's tragically broken in many countries and and that in an era where so much free knowledge is available online for any kid the overwhelming responsibility and, and goal of education should just be to keep alive the fire of curiosity that kids are born with and is so often crushed. And to show why so many things about the world are so interesting. And so that, that's what these, there's, there's hundreds now of these, these videos that are, that take people into, you know, here's just a little bit of math or physics or literature or whatever. Let's make it as exciting as we can. And, and the thrill, honestly, Rob, has been seeing how, how many kids and teachers have responded to this. These are typically, you know, these talks are written by teachers. Um, and then we pair them with an animator. And so a teacher, a great teacher who's, again, who's seen, worked with maybe 1500 kids during their career, uh, can suddenly reach millions with, uh, with, with, with a great lesson. And so, so um, that's a beautiful thing to see. And then the, the other piece of it is that we're encouraging kids to learn to speak. Uh, there's a, there's a, curriculum that allows these TED Ed clubs for them to gather over a few weeks and develop their own mini TED talk and then deliver it to their peers at the end of that time. And, and that's a joyful thing to see because, because that you see these warflower kids who are very nervous about standing up, figuring out how to do it. And, and the confidence they gain from that is pretty cool. Now, in addition to all the content you're creating with the surplus from the conference, you've developed a set of amplifiers, for lack of a better term, that you pump all that content through reaching a whole new audience. One of these is the TED Radio Hour. When did that premiere? Gosh, I think that's, that's at least a couple of years old now. And uh, it went through a couple of uh, early versions. And then we built this, this really wonderful partnership with Guy Raz, who's the current host, and his team at, at uh, NPR. And yeah, every, uh, every week or so, he takes five or six TED Talks that he's clustered around a specific theme and just goes into them in much in more depth. Like you'll, you'll hear excerpts of the talk, you'll hear the speaker interviewed. What do you really mean by that? And what's happened since? And, um, and it's beautifully audio edited. And so as a way of, of listening to Ted on podcast form or on the radio, it's um, so many people love it. And yeah, the numbers are really surprising. I mean, just in digital form, I want to say they're up to a couple million per episode now. A couple million downloads per yeah, episode. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, it's on radio or in many places in the world um, and in surprising numbers as well. And so. hundreds of NPR stations in the United States, correct? Yeah, more than 500. Yeah. yeah. So many, many, many millions, tens of millions of people being reached by that. And then India, uh, that's about to launch, correct? 
that's about to launch. Yeah, we're doing an initial series of eight one-hour episodes, each of which is is it's like a TED session as we'd have at, at the conference. You know, five or six speakers presenting. But um, it's being hosted by a really extraordinary character. If you Google the world's largest movie star, you'll come up with one Shah Rukh Khan, um, who's been the star of many Bollywood movies. But as well as being a great actor, he, he's massively curious. And it turned out to our delight that he's, he's a big Ted fan. And um, he, is, he is a wonderful host of these events, adding a lot of charisma and, and bringing... So it's, these, these are in Hindi, yeah, uh, which is of course the main language in India, and so we we have a chance at reaching many tens of millions of people um, starting in December, and the excitement in India about this is pretty high. Having seen uh, the first, having seen what the episodes look like, they've all been shot now. Uh, we, we we're pretty excited about and this. shot live, right? They're shot in front of a fairly in, large in front audience. of a live audience, an audience so passionate you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, it's just we've we've been very excited to to see. Well, we'll see how it goes when it actually broadcasts. But so far, very excited about the potential there. So again, I when I think about TED, I just think of all these amplifiers. You know, you've got the twenty people who amplify through all these different circles through TEDx. Um, you've got the core talks, which have drawn the TEDx talks. You amplify all of that through the radio and now India. And you do have the amplification of all these extraordinary volunteers. Now, a lot of you'd said earlier that that most media companies, and you spent the majority of your career in media, think about the sheer mass of attention. You think much more and increasingly about the quality of attention as well and ways to measure that. That's a hard thing to do. How have you been tackling that? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a hard thing to do. Um, we usually measure you know, ratings, uh, circulations, view counts, page views, clicks, whatever. Um, which is all quantitative measures. But if you think about it, there's the difference between, you know, clicking on something that you laugh at for one second and then move on versus clicking on something that really moves you. I mean, in certain cases, listening to a wise person can change you forever. Um, the difference between those two things is, is orders of magnitude. And media generally, we're, we're terrible at measuring that. Well, because you wouldn't get paid on that basis in general. In, in most TV, radio, et cetera, won't get paid. Correct. Yeah. Most yeah. most advertising is just purely based on you know n number of eyeballs, and it's very it's just very hard to measure that. And and by the way, that that's why, and this is really worrying. That's why the internet right now is on this sort of path towards arguably towards ever more down market salacious content as soon as you say if you if you're a savvy media company and you say okay we're going to put our algorithms to work we're going to find out what people are quickest to click on that is a guarantee that you're going to discover just how weird humans are and how much we're driven by our lizard brains yeah you know that the, the the route to a click goes directly through your amygdala it's an instinctive response it's it's what danny Kahneman would call system one type thinking it's immediate response. And, and so people click on a clickbaity headline, boom, um, somewhere, somewhere, an algorithm is watching that and uh, is saying, Ooh, let's do more of that. That's how we get more clicks. That's how we get more money. And, um, and so you see the internet, even on good websites down at the bottom somewhere, there's this sludge of crappy, awful clickbaity headlines that kind of, you can totally see why people click on them and you f sometimes find your, your self-loathing self <laughs> clicking on them yourself, Yeah, but they, then they're not good. You know, they're not really advancing the world in any way. And so a fear of any media owner should be, and, and it is for me that if you, if you track just views too much, you will be sending a signal to your people to create whatever talks create those views. And so all, all of the Ted talks that we were, have next year would be from sexologists and I don't know, motivation gurus or whatever. And, and that would be a bad thing. And I would be very sad. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so, so how do you, how do you measure quality? It's really, it's really hard. The way we're thinking about it right now is that we are, we are thinking to ourselves that there are really three main axes on which a, a talk can deliver value. Um, you know, like a great idea can repattern your mind to give you a better sense for how the world is. Yeah how the world is. It, 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 you can call it not knowledge, you can call it insight, um, discovery. Um, and any uh, talk which helps someone 
kind of form a more truthy <laughs> worldview in their minds is that that's a good thing. That is an idea we're spreading. Secondly, you can show people the world as it might be. This is an amazing, this is really the, the amazing, astonishing super, human superpower that you can repattern the world. And so we call this, um, you know, imagination, invention, innovation, design, uh, entrepreneurship, lots of different names, but it's essentially showing the world as it might be. Um, and then the third axis that, that you see in many talks, and again, is, is, is a beautiful thing, I think, is this sense of inspiration, motivation to do the right thing. When this is, by the way, much easier done um, in live talk than in written communication, where, because there's all this biology behind it. You know, when, when an audience is watching someone speaking, they're hearing the tone of voice, they're seeing the slight widening of their eyes um, when, you know, when they talk and that they're making a judgment as to whether they, they feel connected with the person. Um, uh, they, that can really set off fireworks in someone's mind. You can end up really feeling that you and the people around you are connected with them in a powerful way. You want to make their dream come true. So anyway, uh, that's that third axis. You can call it inspiration for want of a better word. And, um, and so we're looking at those three axes and between them trying to say, if, a talk is delivering on at least one of those in a big way, then that's probably an idea worth spreading. Yeah. And so you're, you're still in the process of figuring out how you're going to measure on those axes, but it will suffice it to say, I assume it will be far more complex than a, a simple thumbs up or thumbs down button. Correct. <laughs> far more complex. Yeah. Correct. Um, and it, when you were talking about this transmission of ideas and the transmission of wonder between people, I know from many other conversations with you in the past, you feel that this is one of the most deep rooted things in human psychology and, and indeed is quite or essential to what makes us human and has allowed us to rise to the levels that we're at. I do think that. I think humans in every culture, you know, actually for hundreds of thousands of years, have gathered around campfires. Even before there was real language, you know, we did that. We sort of huddled together. And, um, and lear as we learned to tell stories, um, that became an actual core part of what it was to be human. I actually think people were evolutionarily selected for being good storytellers and good listeners. Because when you think about it, if you can, um, if you hear a story, it gives you new tools to survive. If you hear the, you know, how your friend escaped the lion by doing something clever, that is a toolkit that you can, you can use. And you're more and, likely um, to pass your genes along as a result of that. That's, that's correct. Yeah. And so storytelling and listening to stories just become a deep part of, who we are. And I think it's, it's led to humans being able to act collaboratively, collectively, or what someone can say, this is what we should do. And other people are moot that they, they get it, they see it, they feel it. And so they can act together. And for the vast majority of human history, charismatic speaking was pretty much the only mechanism for persuading groups of people to take action. So evolutionary forces basically wired us to respond to that form of persuasion. But then, as you pointed out in a prior conversation with me, there was a sudden and dramatic change, which is that the written word took off and replaced oratory as the main vector for spreading ideas. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so Gutenberg invented his press and it changed the world. And one reason it changed the world is that everyone who had an idea to share, uh, of course, wrote it down and published it. And that was led to the scientific revolution um, and so forth. And I think... Well, with scalability, and, essentially. With scalability. You yeah. know, if you're Isaac Newton, you want your scientific theory to be read by thousands of people, not just the person next door at your university. Um, and so of course you publish it, you write it and, uh, and, and it's seen by thousands of people that way. And, and so I think an unintended consequence of that is that the art of public speaking with it on the vine a bit yeah. and people didn't pay attention to it as much. And for many people, our knowledge of public speaking is the boring university lecture or the dismal, shrieky priest or, or some politician with an ax to grind and, um, uh, and, and long, long, long talks. And, um, so something amazing happened. Um, at least this is my own narrative now and maybe yes. it's, maybe it's rubbish, but it seems to me that the weird quirky technology of, um, online video, yeah. um, which started into existence in 2006 actually is its own kind of Gutenberg moment because it allowed this ancient art now to scale in the same way that you know, the Gutenberg press did suddenly talks can escape the room. I mean, to me, it's, 
uh, I, I just got overwhelmed by this thought back in 2006, 2007, the fact that we were suddenly in a world where a single speaker could have their ideas heard by millions and millions of people around the world and that anyone, any curious soul in the world suddenly had access to hear live, as it were, from the world's greatest thinkers. That, that just struck me as, as astonishing. Um, Ted's only a tiny part of this, of course. And, and what it's inspired, I think what it sparked is a complete renaissance in the art of public speaking. Yeah. Suddenly everyone says, wait a sec, I could, I could spend two years writing a book and it might be seen by 50,000 people. Or I could, I could develop a talk in three months. And if I'm, if I'm lucky, it's going to be seen by 50,000, maybe a million people. And so suddenly it's become worthwhile trying to relearn how you do it the right way. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because I, as we, just as you were speaking and as I was thinking about those centuries, you know, in which writing was dominant and you mentioned Isaac Newton, it occurred to me, I don't know much about Mr. Newton's, Sir Newton's biography, but I imagine that he was an exceptionally smart and very ambitious person for all the things that he achieved. And a person like that in Greco-Roman times would have spent hundreds or even thousands of hours honing his capabilities as a public speaker. You know, oratory was so vitally important. And then post-Gutenberg, that entire cadre of, of humans for generations and generations and generations, instead of spending those thousands of hours honing their oratory, spent those thousands of hours becoming very crisp, clear writers. And, you know, there was a, there was a sense when I was a child in the 70s that the world was ending in part because the written words seemed to be dying because all of a sudden, you know, the really ambitious people were directing their energies into the mass media and being, you know, being good on radio and being good on television and that kind of thing. And um, it is intriguing how, at least within a certain subset of the population, let's call it public intellectuals um, and people who are really trying to really hit people's neurons hard. It, there's been this pivot, and I think you're very modest to put Ted as a small part of it, but I think when we talk about serious people really trying to influence a lot of people and having been able, you know, having to force themselves to be, to be happy with 50 to 100,000 readers for a very serious book, suddenly reaching, I, realizing I can reach millions through a talk, it really does bring things full circle in a powerful way and in an incredibly recent way. And I think it's one of the explanations for why podcasting is exploding right yeah. now. It's exciting. You know, someone like Sam Harris, who, who you've spoken to, yes. spent years and years and years writing, you know, books that really did very well. But now a single one of his podcasts does better than all of his books collectively. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's really a remarkable thing. And part of it is that there is something extra you get just by listening to a voice. You, you learn more about that person. Um, it's more visceral. It's more biological. Like there's, there's, it's more deeply ingrained in us, I think, as to we know how to listen and absorb that kind of information better somehow, just because our, our brains got selected to do it. Yeah. And, and for now, this is not yet available to most of us, but that's about to change in the next several years, maybe 10 or 15 years, two to three billion people are going to get online very, very suddenly. And in a prior discussion, you described it as perhaps the biggest social experiment ever. Why do you think it's so significant and what role might Ted in an ideal world play in this transition? So Google and Facebook and SpaceX and others have spoken of investing billions of dollars into basically bringing the internet to the world. And we're talking high bandwidth internet at super low cost if, if they're tech visions are to be believed. And, and certainly any tech trend that you look at makes it not that hard to believe. So, and it, these are the, the, these are generally the poorer and more remote quarters that are not yet online that right. are going to be targeted with this extraordinarily fast bandwidth. Right. That feels inevitable with so many people working on it. Right. Right now, anywhere you go in the world, you see people with cell phones, um, but they, they're typically just for voice and, and text. What's coming is that everyone in the world pretty much will have access to a phone that is plugged into a video based uh, internet. And I don't, I don't think the full significance of that has actually landed with, with a lot of people. It strikes me as highly profound for global history. For one thing, I think about 2 billion people in the world right now are thought of as illiterate uh, because they are excluded from the main means by which humanity communicates with, its, with each other, which is through the written word. 
they will now be able to communicate with the thing that they grew up with, which is a spoken word. You know, that device won't, they won't look at it and go, I don't know what these symbols are. They'll switch it on and it'll say, hello, friend, what would you like to learn today? Although it may also say something else. It may say, how can I exploit you today? How can I rip you off today? How can I recruit you for some nefarious purpose today? What that device says to them strikes me as incredibly important for the for the world's future and uh, we need we just need much more focus on this ted ought to have a role to play because um i I, you know in principle there is no reason why you couldn't put a wise voice and give everyone access to that wise voice in their own language on topics that are relevant to them uh, potentially give them the information the empowerment they need to build a better life for themselves And we have a lot of the tools in place where we could actually make an offering here. For example, the three and a half thousand TEDx uh, curation teams around the world. Yeah. And all those translators. And those are boots on the ground and all those incredible organizers. I mean, anybody's putting on a TEDx event in a large city has somebody who's incredibly well-resourced, very well-connected, somebody who's very, very good at getting things done. You You have boots on the ground in all of these places. That we do, we do. We don't yet know, though, how to you know channel all this and make this work. But I would love to believe that in the future there are there will be um, not just you know a few thousand sort of TED talks in English radiating out into the world, but thousands and thousands of locally relevant talks in local languages um, that that are empowering and and allow people allow humanity to share. Knowledge. The future of the world is terrifying if you think of it as 12 billion mouths to feed coming soon your way. The world is going to struggle with that. If you think of it as 12 billion minds, each of which could make some kind of contribution to the future, the future potentially gets thrilling. There's all the talk of artificial intelligence. The potential for human intelligence is barely scratched yet. And we suddenly have within us the means to transformatively change those minds and empower them and give them the knowledge and the motivation and the encouragement to be part of that process. That's worth striving for. One way or another, it's definitely the biggest experiment that humanity has ever undertaken. You said something a moment ago, you were talking about speaking to people about issues of significance to them in their own language. That reminds me of a story you told me very recently. Uh, Ted Global just happened in Tanzania, was it? And uh, tell the story of the Kenyan farmer. You said it was one of one of the best and most moving and most successful talks at Arusha. <laughs> so a few months earlier, we'd gone to Nairobi and, and found this remarkable character, this farmer called Kasila, um, who... Um, had struggled in his village, on his village farm, because of climate change and other things. Basically, the d- desertification was destroying everything. And um, his insight, you know, he went, he went to get trained and started learning things. And his huge insight was that, that that knowledge was actually valuable. And so he started this local movement of sort of bringing people together and saying, we can teach each other. When he was on stage at uh, Arusha, he said, the, the seeds that farmers need to plant are the seeds of knowledge in each other's minds. That is how we can, we can create a future. And he showed these images of, you know, the before side of this desert and, you know, like nothing. And then the after where they'd use these modern irrigation techniques and other things of this fertile, beautiful, you know, uh, plant filled scene with happy villagers. And it was, it was so inspiring and beautiful. And he was such, such a great character. So, the, so, that the, the the thought that that type of peer to peer local level encouragement and enabling could happen is 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 certainly to me deeply inspiring. So, in keeping with the theme of providing billions of new internet users with relevant talks in their own languages, you have some interesting assets to leverage. Once again, there's the thirty five hundred teams behind all those local TEDxs, and meanwhile, this fascinating experiment that's just launching in India which will give you dozens of top-tier TED Talks in the main language of a country that will supply hundreds of millions of the Internet's new users. Now, I can imagine you bringing these two things together, maybe asking the dozens of TEDx teams in India to curate a huge catalog of talks for their fellow citizens who are about to come online. And if that worked, you could replicate this across all the TEDx locales and potentially have a huge impact with just that tiny team of full-timers in New York. Now, that's just a hypothetical, but it illustrates that there's a certain type of problem solving that's best addressed 
by non-governmental philanthropies like TED. Companies wouldn't do this because they have to earn money for their shareholders and they can't access a huge volunteer base. And no one government could do this because it's a global issue, not a national one. As we continue to globalize and to digitize, which pushes us to globalize more and more, do you see a broadening role for philanthropy in, in tackling big cross-national problems? I certainly think it's it's an exciting thing to contemplate. You know, philanthropy as a topic is pretty boring to most <laughs> most people. Um, and, you know, there's possibly a reason for it. I mean, a lot of, a lot of philanthropic pitches are kind of, you kind of feel like you have to pay attention, but it, it sort of goes to a particular part of you where if that itch is scratched too often, you just feel exhausted by it. And most people don't have, uh, the, the, you know, there's this term compassion fatigue, which people suffer from. And so when you look at how much wealth there is in the world, you look at um, people who've made absolute fortunes, you know, some of them come to TED, we talk with them, like, as I think you, you would agree with this, I, I certainly feel this, most of those people really would be so excited to use some of the same talents they've used to build a business, to make their mark in the world and to achieve something. It's just really hard to know how, you know, human systems are really complicated. Most ways that you spend money to press a button somewhere you know, end up with some unintended consequence and it's hard, it's hard to get the result you want. But the optimist in me thinks that there's a huge underexplored category of, of truly bold ideas that, that with the right kind of, you know, imagination could do something because the world is more connected than ever before. It means that, that there are opportunities in that to, make powerful things happen. I mean, certainly the growth of TED has been surprising and it's, but it's all been made possible by the internet could not have been done remotely, you know, 50 years ago. So what, what are the other ways in which someone with vision and money could make a huge difference? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by that question. I think there are actually dozens and dozens of very exciting answers in there. And one of the ways to get rid of people's gloom about the future, which some people seem to have right now and get excited again, is to live in that space and dream about actually what, what could you do? Let's, let's say that, you know, you had 10, 50 or a hundred million dollars to spend. What could you do in this connected world? I think there are actually amazing answers to that question. Is it a matter of public record what you spent to buy Ted or what you, the foundation spent to buy Ted? Yes. The, the foundation spent $6 million dollars. I think that's pretty interesting evidence that, you know, great magnified things can happen from philanthropic investments. Yeah, that was money well spent. <laughs> that was money very, very well spent. It really was. Um, well, you've been very generous with your time, as you always are with me, Chris. So thank you very kindly for your time and for sharing uh, your story uh, and the unbelievable story of Ted, which is very much... I always feel it, but I've really never felt it more than in 2017 that TED is a work in process. Thank you, Rob. Uh, this is a great podcast. You've got a great journey ahead of you. So thank you. I have to say I agree with Chris that the $6 million was very well spent. But I'll add something he'd never point out himself, which is that the greater act of generosity is the 16 years and counting that Chris has gifted of his life, working extremely long hours in a highly visible and stressful job for which he travels hundreds of thousands of miles per year, all this for a salary of zero. Now, when Ted was bought, Chris was comfortable but not spectacularly wealthy. He was also two other things, a seasoned entrepreneur with an amazing track record and a quiet contemplative person deeply enamored with the world of ideas. Whichever of these attributes you focus on, you would not expect this 16-year gift. Highly qualified entrepreneurs who are not yet spectacularly wealthy invariably start another company. I mean every time. Trust me, I've seen it. Meanwhile, contemplative people who love books and ideas and are economically comfortable do not take on crazy public high-stress jobs for decades at a stretch. So TED is an extraordinary gift on a level that goes far beyond money. And when Chris talks about the potential of philanthropy, of the notion of an underexplored realm of truly bold philanthropic ideas, he speaks as one who's given immensely himself. This is noteworthy because many of the biggest winners in our economy set aside a week every year to bask in the main TED conference, which is to say in the bounty of this enormous act of giving. May it be an inspiration to all of them. 
Next week, my guest will be someone who's every bit as concerned as Chris is about the level of public discourse, about withered attention spans and the perverse incentives of ad models that are choking the web in low common denominator clickbait. It may surprise you that this person co-founded Twitter and was its largest shareholder and also its CEO for a couple of years. But that won't surprise you if you already know Ev Williams. Like Chris, Ev is a deep thinker about ideas, their importance, and our urgent need for far more nuanced thought and communication. Much of his philosophy is embodied in Medium.com, the company launched in 2012 and still runs. Ev's story is every bit as fascinating as Chris's and Ted's, and I hope you'll join me to hear it. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd also like to encourage you to visit after-on.com, where you'll find many other episodes just like it. Unhurried, wide-ranging, and delving deep into a complex but fascinating subject. Topics include artificial intelligence, terrorism, synthetic biology, quantum computing, and yes, even space archaeology. Go to after-on.com to find easy links to all these episodes. There you can also sign up for my newsletter, which will inform you of all my new episodes as they release. You can also keep up on new releases by following me on Twitter. I am at Rob underscore Reed, R-E-I-D. And of course, by subscribing to my podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Last, whether you love or hate this show, I'd appreciate it if you could rate it and review it on iTunes. Tell me what I'm doing great or doing poorly. You'll definitely reach me as I do read each and every review. 